Hi, I'm Mike with Ubtastic. I'm sitting down here at SCNA with Brian Merrick. Uh, Brian Merrick has uh, spoken, you speak a lot to non-technical audiences doing agile training. Uh, you've even done exercises where you simulated what a program does and, and how a computer works for, for um, uh, a business audience. And then you also come to highly technical conferences like SCNA and talk about how to write software better and dig really deep into um, concepts uh, behind why we write software the way we do. I'm just wondering about going between these two worlds and, and talking to these two very different ways of thinking audiences. How do you, how do you uh, uh, handle approaching those two different types of talks or audiences? So um, I think that the way to think about it is the two kinds of talks that I do are one is an explanation of something. Uh, so for example, I just did an explanation of logic programming and test data generation here. And the other is more a way to, I guess, stick memes in people's heads. Right. So the goal of, a, of the how to do something talk, which is most technical talks, is to tell people something with the expectation that at the end they'll be able to repeat a good amount of it back to me. Right. So I'm trying to give them an explanation of something that makes logical sense to them. So it sticks in their mind as a, as a sequential set of explanations. And usually the way you, that works with that is to cast it as a story of some sort. So we are, we're beings, we live in time, so when we think about explanations, we tend to think of, we, we should think of them as sort of logical consequences of one fact and another, but what we actually do is we think of, we tend to think of them more as things moving through time. So you tell a story where the things happen and then another thing happens and then another thing happens, and you lay that over the logical argument that you're making. And so since we're so built to, to listen to stories and tell stories, that helps people tell the story back to you. So that's my goal in a technical narrative. kind of, yes, uh, in a technical kind of talk. Now, the other kinds of talks uh, are more sort of meme implantation talks. So, for example, I've done a, 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 a series of talks where I keep uh, hammering away at the question of what are the values that didn't get written down in the Agile Manifesto. Mm -hmm. So there are some, uh, the latest version has something like seven of them. And so the, the purpose of that talk is to get words, really, stuck in the heads of the listeners. So, one of the words is ease, okay. uh, for example. An argument of mine that I, that I make is that when I look at Agile groups, people are very focused on making their work not easy, but with ease. So, for example, my wife is a surgeon, or has been a surgeon, and she describes the process of surgery, when you've got a really good surgical team working with you, is you're sort of talking through what you're doing and you reach out your hand and the right instrument magically appears in it and you just move it. So there's that sense of ease. And the idea of giving examples of ease and using that is that when people run into problems, I want things like ease to pop in their mind. Right. So we... You know, when we're solving this problem, we should think about ease, or we should think about being reactive rather than proactive, which is a, another characteristic of Agile projects. So that's the goal of the, the kind of non-technical talk. It's to, to make things stick in people's heads. And uh, I also do keynotes. Uh, a keynote has the same sort of property of making things stick in people's heads, but the real goal of a keynote is to force speakers who come after you to refer back to the keynote. Oh, so, set a theme. Yes. 
But the uh, the thing with the, uh, the 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 setting those you call it the meme is I just wonder is it because these ideas are often hard and esoteric, but having one thing you can kind of hold on to gives you an anchor, and then you can work back from that or use that as a point of reference. Is that? Well, the the main thing is is I think just getting people to think of it. Mm -hmm. uh, you're in a situation. There's an idea that would be useful. How do you get? How do you like, program people? such that when they're in a situation where that idea is useful, they actually think of that idea. Right. So that you, to do that, you have to have, you, know, you have to have the craft, I guess, of you know, telling stories, uh, visual representations stick in people's minds. So if you're presenting an idea both visually and auditory, it sticks better than if you're only doing one of them. Uh, jokes work. Lots of different methods to get that word or that simple concept into their head and then such that it'll pop out when they need it. And when they need it, then they can go and figure out what that really means in their situation. Yeah, I, w I was just thinking about earlier today, I saw a tweet that, um, that uh, some study discovered that by Introducing humor into education, test scores in mm -hmm. that in that experiment went up mm -hmm. because, because I, for whatever reason I haven't read the article yet, but for some reason humor helped with the lesson and mm -hmm. that people remembered it better and were able to synthesize whatever information so at least that way they could return it, regurgitate it or whatever on a test right. they were able to retain it. Um, uh, but also when you talked about the symbols. Humans tend to think in a symbolic. That's why with Sarah's talk, when she was showing how she introduced symbols and, and visual metaphors into the, the teaching that she's doing or the mentoring, mm -hmm. that it seemed like people were better able to wrap their heads around these topics mm -hmm. and, and understand them. Um, but as far as, far as uh, speaking to an agile community, uh, you, you've gone and you've spoken at, at uh, user groups are there, are there like agile user groups? Are there like things that where people who are, who are doing these um, uh, agile planning, agile coaching, do they get together and have user groups? Um, they certainly have. I've drifted away from agile uh, per se, being an agile coach over the past, uh, I guess now three years. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure of the current state of things, but uh, at the Agile Alliance webpage, there used to be a whole page full of user groups with contact information. I assume at least some of those user groups are still existing and still running. Were, were they basically this? Uh, I've not been to those user groups. I've mostly been focused on a technical user group. But I, I'm, have you gone back and forth between those over the years and seen how they handle their teaching and learning? Uh, together as a community, or or even at the conferences, uh, not so much because I I live in the middle of nowhere, uh, so it's not like I live in Chicago right. where I can go to users groups. Uh, my going to a user group pretty much has to overlap the time I'm on a trip and being in the user group. So I don't have a lot of useful things to say about user groups. Well, at the, at the conferences, though, um, an Agile or a conference versus a technical conference, is there a difference in the way the communities interact with each other, or how do, how do they... Is there been any market difference aside from the general topics of the conversations um, between the two different groups, the two communities? Um... I don't think so in the particular case of the Agile groups. Um, the Agile groups were, especially in the beginning, pretty heavily uh, programmer dominated. Uh, uh, Pete McBreen said way back in the beginning of Agile, uh, the buzzword, that the Agile methodologies are methodologies created by people who like to program. Right. So it was dominantly programmer-ish back then. And I think 
to whatever extent there's a, a unique programmer culture, the agile culture tended to to pick up that. So there's a certain playfulness, for example, uh, you, that appears in both groups. I don't get invited to speak at like, sales conferences right. or things like that. So I don't. I, I'm not sure that the two communities are are really that far apart. Okay, and and just one thing about the way uh, uh, you you craft your presentations. Uh, how what is what is your process for for creating a presentation for keynotes? Um, it's somewhat random uh, in in the, the sort of the same way. I mean. One of the reasons why I became sort of an early advocate of Agile is that that matches my style. Uh, and like I said, one of the values of Agile is you react to information rather than proactively do things. That is, you, you do little experiments, you try things, you see what happens, you get good visibility into what's happening and you react to that. So a lot of my talks uh, start out with a basic idea. I don't write outlines. I haven't written an outline for anything for since I was in like high school. Um, and my talks are very, very low on word count, very high on pictures, but not just the random picture, but a picture that's actually used in the explanation. And I got to admit that the the way my talks happen is I'll be, this is what I'm gonna talk about. Here's uh, my theme. I go to YouTube or Flickr <laughs> looking for a you know, Creative Commons picture along those lines. I get a picture, I fit it in there, and the content of the picture, since I'm talking about abstractions in some way, uh, the content of the picture will change my talk. Okay. So it's almost, in some ways, this is for the less technical talks. In some ways, it's almost kind of picture-driven development, whichever picture I find. And then um, then it's a matter of, of practicing it and becoming fairly sensitive to the, to the rougher spots. Um, and it can be hard to notice those, but you, you talk about it, you talk about it, you talk about it, you keep talking, you keep practicing it and you see the rough spots, and I go through lots of revisions of moving things around and throwing things out and so on and so forth. So, for example, a talk I just gave is on its ninth revision. Twelve or fourteen revisions of a talk is not unusual. Okay. Well, thank you very much for taking the time to sit down with me. Yeah. Appreciate thank it. You.